We're going to talk today about um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is old news to everybody here. Uh, the background of, of DMD or Duchenne muscular dystrophy is known to all of you. It's the most common progressive childhood neuromuscular disease and affects one in every 3,500 births. It's an inherited X chromosome linked recessive genetic disorder. However, many of the cases, as you know, are also spontaneous mutations. It results from an absence of dystrophin, which is the protein in the muscle cell wall that's necessary for muscles to be able to repair themselves and then grow uh, as part of um, muscle growth in general. The DMD gene was discovered in 1987 by Eric Hoffman, who is the head of the Hoffman Labs, catchy name. Uh, he works at Children's, for those of you who don't know that. All of you had to take, uh, when you took your pediatric boards, had to know something about DMD, because I'm sure every one of us on our boards had a question about this. It's a motor developmental delay, is one of the clinical signs that you would have found on an academic test. Hypertrophy of the calves, everybody remembers the inverted champagne bottle appearance of the calf. With progressive weakness, only occurs in boys, they have an abnormal gait, they end up in, unable to walk by the age of 10 to 12. You may or may not have learned about um, associated cognitive and behavioral abnormalities. Um, and all of us learned that death was going to occur in early childhood in these boys. Uh, from either respiratory failure or heart failure due to muscle weakness. And this is the um, boy who you would have seen and recognized as having had muscular dystrophy. So when you watch him walk, he can't get his feet off the ground. He never leaves double stance phase when he's walking. And you can see that he waddles from side to side with a Trendelenburg. And this is him getting up from the floor in a classic Gowers maneuver, the same thing that we all had to learn about, so that he pushes up and he has to walk up his legs in order to stand up. Now, if you watch him walking again, he has a lot of lordosis because his hip extensors are so weak. And he's up on his toes in order to be able to put the focus of gravity behind his knee to keep him standing. Walking upstairs is extremely difficult for him, and he's mostly using his arms to get up. Walking down is even harder. And if you watch, he's, he hasn't been hesitant to do much yet in this video, but coming downstairs is actually difficult for him, which is why he slowed down a little bit. This guy's about five years old. Okay, but when we look at what happens in real life, things are a little bit different. And part of the reason that we wanted to talk to you today and actually were able to convince Mark Weissman to let us be on the um, schedule today is because over the course of the last year in the neuromuscular clinic at Children's Hospital, we've seen four patients who uh, were m missed in diagnosis. And these are not patients who were somewhere um, seeing somebody who wasn't well trained. One of the patients had been followed for his entire life by someone who's on the adjunct staff at Children's National Medical Center. Another one of the patients was seen by one of the faculty members at Children's two years before he was diagnosed. And the neuromuscular exam in his case said that uh, he was uncooperative with the exam, so it was impossible to tell what was really going on. But if we talk about these cases and see what happened, I think we can see that, that it's not always the way it was on our exam or our board exams. The first case is that of an eight-year-old boy with a history of hip pain for six years when he was referred to, the, to our MDA clinic at Children's. He had had a rheumatologic workup at the time of the initial um, symptoms. So when he was two years old, he had a rheumatological workup for, for hip pain, which was the reason why his, his gait was thought to be abnormal. He hadn't started walking independently until he was 18 months old. He had had difficulty rising from the floor uh, that was noted somewhere between two and three years of age by his pediatrician. And this was described as a Gower's maneuver in the chart notes from the pediatrician. He had increased difficulty standing from a seated position. 
increased difficulty running, navigating stairs, he was falling more as he was getting older. And again, all of this had been noted, but was believed to be secondary to uh, what was thought to still be undiagnosed hip pain. On exam, when, when we saw him in our clinic, he was weak, he had tight heel cords, he had tight, tightness in the iliotibial bands, so it was difficult for him to get into to AD duction at the, or get his legs together at the hips. He had tight finger flexors and he had an abnormal gait. The first time that he had uh, serum kinase level tested was through our clinic and it was greater than 14,000 units. Um, DNA testing showed that he had Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Case number two is that of an eight and a half year old with a history of developmental delay, some autistic type features. Uh, he had had behavioral problems at school. He had very significant attention problems. And also part of his history was that he was having trouble going up and down stairs and keeping up with his peers. He hadn't walked until he was 20 months and had always been a toe walker, but all of this was being attributed to his behavioral problems. The family history was positive when we, when we um, gathered the family history for several relatives, not primary relatives, but uh, more distant relatives on the maternal side with, with diagnosed muscular dystrophy. And on exam, he had marked hypertrophy of his calves, weakness, tight iliotibial bands, um, tight heel cords, an abnormal gait. He, it took him 12 seconds to get up from the floor, which is a very long time, and he used a Gower's maneuver. And he walked at 10, 10 meters in 7.4 seconds, which is an indicator that he would probably be in a wheelchair, he was expected to be in a wheelchair within about a year. His CK was also elevated, not as much as in the first case, and DNA testing showed uh, DMD as well. So this was a boy who, again, the focus had been on his behavioral problems and on his attention problems. In case number three, an eight and a half year old was refer referred to an orthopedic surgeon and to the toe walking clinic at Children's. The PA there picked up that she thought that there was something a little bit different than, um, than just run of the mill toe walking or idiopathic toe walking. He had been 14 months old when he started walking. His history was positive for a cousin, a first cousin who had um, muscular dystrophy. Um, he had calf hypertrophy, the sa same sorts of things that we were finding in the others. Again, CK level was first obtained from, um, from our clinic, and he had a, a serum kinase that was greater than 12,000, also has muscular dystrophy. And then perhaps the most unusual case is that of a boy who we saw just a few months ago who's a 17-year-old. Now, this guy has a history of chronic leg pain for 10 years. It was worse over the last three years. He's a, pay, a guy who had been described um, over time as being a goofball, spent a lot of time on the floor, wouldn't get up, or always seemed to take his time getting up. He um, was premature, so that perhaps, uh, again, clouded the picture of why he might have walked a little bit later and was a funny walker. Um, he, when, when we saw him in clinic, he was 52 kilos and 170 centimeters tall, so he's extremely thin. Uh, he had plantar flexion contractures and was extremely weak, is unable to get up from a uh, normal chair. This had been noted in school, but again, um, was thought to be more of a behavioral problem by, by the people who were seeing him. His CK was 17,000 and he also has muscular dystrophy. So I think this isn't always so easy and it's not always the same as what we uh, learned and, and what we're tested on in school. And I think that um, sometimes the only things that we see with uh, clinical signs in real life and with, with um, our regular patients is that the focus is more, more on a bit of gross motor delay. Maybe he's clumsier. Maybe he's slower than the other guys in his class. He's a toe walker, but these days who isn't, right? He has trouble running. Really a lot of difficulty getting up from getting up stairs, and the biggest thing is that these guys fall a lot. Um, again, a lot of them are written off to being goofball guys, um, but these guys are the slowest guys on the playground. So I think if you're hearing you know, from, from the preschool teachers or the kindergarten teachers that kids are slow on the playground, if the teachers are noticing it, they probably are significantly slower. Um, these children have, have some sort of learning disabilities. Many of them have cognitive delay. And a lot of the work that, again, has been done in genetics shows that um, several, of the, several of these guys have an increased incidence of genes that have been associated with autism. And here's another video of twins who are eight years old. 
I'm sorry. And you can watch them walking, and they still have a lot of the same finding as, as the little boy who we looked at first. But these guys are older, they're faster, they're goofballs, look at them. But Mark Lordosis, again, to keep hip extension, using, using the back muscles to keep hip extension up on their toes. You never see a heel strike with either one of these guys. But these guys are still running at the age of eight. I think if you, when you can see their calf muscles, they're pretty big. Again, they're twins. A lot of arm motion, a little bit more than you would expect to see in guys running. A little bit of foot action there. So that somebody who runs like this is weak. If you see somebody in your clinic who's running this way, he, he's weak. He's using a lot of accessory muscles to be able to, um, to run. He'll get tired faster. These are jumping jacks. These guys never leave the floor. Now, this is how they get up from the floor. So still at Gowers, but we don't see them turning over. So I think, again, that's something to take a look at. And once again, coming downstairs is harder, so boys are slower at it. But these guys are still strong enough to be able to get up and down the stairs without using their hands, almost. Okay, so when we look at um, what happens with uh, patients who have DMD and what happens from the first clinical signs in retrospect until they're diagnosed, this is from a, um, a multi-center series of over 400 patients that was collected from the STAR network, which is run um, in conjunction with, with um, the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Still, fairly consistently, the average time that the first sign or symptom that's noted of weakness in these boys is somewhere around two and a half years old. The first time that, they, that they're evaluated for these signs, though, tends to be about a year later. And then the first time that they're referred to a specialist with, with suspicion of a neuromuscular disease is two years after the, um, the time that they've been seen. It still takes a while for diagnostic testing to be done, and the definitive diagnosis is still two and a half years after the first signs or symptoms of weakness or signs or symptoms associated with muscular dystrophy. That delay of two and a half years from the first sign or symptom until the time of diagnosis has been pretty consistent over the last two decades. So I think that um, we, a lot of things are getting better. I know we've been hearing through the conference about how things are getting better over time, but um, this is something that stayed pretty much the same. So what we're trying to do in this area is see what could we come up with that would be helpful to get these guys to earlier diagnosis. And I think the simple and easiest thing is to look at the serum kinase. It's very sensitive. Um, there are very few things that elevate the serum kinase to the point that muscular dystrophy does in boys. The serum kinase is elevated 50 to 200 times greater than normal in these guys. And so that's not going to be subtle, right? I mean, it's not as though it's, it's 10 over or 20 over and you don't know if you're in a gray zone. It's 50 to 200 times greater than normal. This is an easy and inexpensive blood test that can be done and, um, and can be done really out of any lab and ordered by anybody, but only approximately 40% of the time, again, in this, the star-based data, has the pediatrician been the one to order this first. You, you might wonder what, what matters and why would it matter if you uh, pick this up earlier because as most of you probably know, there still is no cure for muscular dystrophy. You're still going to be having to give money to um, the telethon every year, probably throughout our lifetimes, but maybe not. Um, and anything that looks promising is so expensive that again, uh, I doubt I'll still be in practice when, um, when any of the things that, that look promising today are put into effect. 
However, children who were diagnosed earlier have much better quality of life and are able to stay ambulatory for longer if they're seen earlier and start treatment earlier. What we're doing now for treatment is primarily the use of corticosteroids and what that does is allow children to be able to use their muscles longer to stay up longer. It also keeps children in the loop of clinical trials and gives them exposure to things that might become more promising. It allows earlier genetic counseling for families so that family planning can be done in a way that a family wants to and in the event that families would like to, to prevent future pregnancies with boys who have muscular dystrophy, it gives them the information so that they can choose to do what they want. It provides access for these families and these boys to be able to learn early on how better to take care of their bodies in spite of the fact that they have a degenerative neuromuscular disease and that keeps them more comfortable as they get older and also once again keeps their bodies in better shape. I mean, from my standpoint, the boys uh, and, and everybody whose body is in better shape with any of these progressive things that we don't know how to fix yet, the people whose bodies are in good shape are going to be the ones who get to be first in line for the trials of the new and magic bullet because those are the, the patients who are going to have the best outcome. And if you're the one running the study, you want your study to look great, right? So if we can keep these children in good shape, they're more likely to have better access to uh, be able to Im improve their quality of life and possibly have access to something that would be curative. So what do we do for early diagnosis? Well, any boy with, development, with delayed gross motor development should be suspected of having muscular dystrophy. And that doesn't mean they're all going to have it, but if you suspect it, you'll find it. If you don't, you probably won't. Um, and global developmental delay does not rule this out. So motor delay in boys, you have to have somewhere in your mind that it might be muscular dystrophy. Boys who are non-ambulatory by the age of 18 months, go ahead and check a CK. And I don't think that matters if it's a boy who has a corrected age, who's been premature and has a corrected age of 18 months, or if he has a chronologic age of 18 months. But when you're seeing these guys at 18 months and they're still not walking, if it's a boy, order a CK. It's easy and it's inexpensive. And then if you find that the CK is elevated, certainly refer him to a neuromuscular specialist. The other caveat is that if for any reason, uh, for, for whatever reason, if uh, a child has liver enzymes drawn and transaminases are normal, I'm sorry, but the transaminases are elevated with the exception of the GGT, which is the only liver specific transaminase, then you need to be suspicious of muscular dystrophy in that case as well. Because, because of the muscle destruction, the transaminases will be elevated uh, that are in muscle. Okay, the other thing that I think is important is when these children are in your practice and you're continuing to follow them is to know that over time recommendations have really changed with regards to preventative care in cardiac uh, and pulmonary medicine and that is that, that uh, what we're trying to do is see boys earlier on to be able to take care of their lungs a little bit better um, at, because by the time they're not walking well already their lungs are a little bit weaker. So um, we need to be looking at that and paying attention to that with um, pulmonary function tests. The other thing is that uh, it's pretty clear now that paying attention to the cardiac muscle, even though it's still doing what it needs to do right now, we can use preventative medications in order to be able to help it work better longer. All of these guys need pneumococcal and influenza uh, vaccines done on a regular basis because they're much more susceptible to any sort of respiratory infection uh, just by virtue of the fact that they're, they're weaker and so the, the pump mechanism for their lungs, the bellows mechanism, just doesn't work as well. Bone health is important for everybody. I know you talked about vitamin D yesterday um, and bone health overall. These guys are at higher risk for two reasons. One is most of them will have been treated with high dose steroids, which already puts you at risk for um, increase in osteopenia and osteoporosis and a significant increased risk for fractures. But the other thing is that sedentary children uh, are also, also have a higher risk of having um, significantly worse bone health. So we need to be paying attention to that. I'm sure you could tell by the lecture yesterday that everybody knows uh, just about nothing yet about what's exactly the right thing to do about bone health. But we do need to keep paying attention to that and uh, be 
uh, suspicious about whether or not children have adequate vitamin D because, uh, once again, sedentary boys and uh, probably spend a little bit less time outside. And um, all, of, all of our patients who are on their feet less often have, in general, a lower vitamin D. I think there's more to come on that. Um, other things, boys who are treated with, uh, with high-dose steroids are at risk for being significantly shorter than other children. Look in the next several years for some information about growth hormone and whether or not that will be used. Uh, you may see that. But um, again, a screening test, a 16-year-old boy who's still Tanner stage 1 should be referred to endocrinology um, for delayed onset puberty and possible hormone replacement. Nutrition is key. Again, all of these guys who are under treatment are on steroids. They're hungry all the time. They're moving less. They're eating more, which is the opposite of what we want to do for children um, who, who are at risk for obesity. And all children who, are, uh, who have special health care needs uh, run a risk for obesity at a lower BMI than children who do not have special health care needs. So be, worry about obesity in boys um, with muscular dystrophy who have a BMI that's greater than the 85th percentile and think about the work, the associated workup for a metabolic syndrome at that time. The other thing that, again, is primarily a complication of steroids is um, that children are at risk to develop cataracts because of again, because of the, the steroid use, so should be followed more closely by an ophthalmologist than they would have been otherwise. And this is just information about um, the Muscular Dystrophy Association Clinic at Children's National Medical Center. Um, we, on our team, we have uh, a neurologist who is Carolina Tessie Rocha, and she's the head of the neuromuscular program at Children's. Um, the, myself and Dr. Morosova are also in the clinic, and we're co-directors of the clinic. We have um, specific physicians from cardiology, pulmonary, uh, orthopedic surgery who are working with us. We have a physical therapist who works in our clinic all the time, Tina Duong, who is associated with the Hoffman Labs. Kara Simpson is our genetic counselor. Um, for social work, we have Marie Ritto. And then the most important name on here is our clinical coordinator, and that's Sarah Kaminsky. So if you have any questions or worries about um, either diagnostic questions about younger boys or about patients of yours who have muscular dystrophy who are being followed in our clinic, Sarah is the person to speak with. Thank you very much.